indeed is planetary health and why it's relevant now more than ever, especially with the COVID-19 crisis. We'll debunk some myths and misconceptions, learn about the challenges humanity currently face through different lenses with their potential solutions. So here is the outline of today's webinar. The talks will last for about 40 minutes and then followed by a 15 minute question and answer session. Let me also remind everyone about the webinar house rules. So please maintain um, your microphones on mute and um, turn off your cameras during the talks except for the speakers. You'll have the chance to unmute your mics and turn on your cameras during the Q&A session. To help you remember and take note of your questions, please feel free to use the chat box during the talks. Please also be reminded that this webinar is being recorded. And lastly, but not the least, enjoy the webinar. So here is Priscilla who will introduce to us our speakers. Hello, good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Yeah, we yes. can you. Okay, great, okay. Yes. yes. I was getting a heart attack already. Um, well, uh, today our speakers are Dr. Renzo and Dr. Andres. Um, briefly speaking, uh, Dr. Renzo is, um, is a medical doctor with a PhD from Harvard University. He's a, he's a He's from the Philippines originally, and he's working at the Nexus of Global Health and Sustainable Development. He's actually the chief uh, planetary doctor of the Public Health Lab, which is called Global Think and Do Tank, which is aimed to advance um, the health of both people and the planet. He has worked with very many different institutions, among which are the Philippines Department of Health, the International Organization for Migration, the World Health Organization, the World Bank, um, healthcare Without Harm, UP Manila Universal Healthcare Study Group in the Philippines, and the Harvard Center for Climate Health and the Global De and Global Development. Um, our second um, our second speaker is uh, Dr. Andres Gachitoreno. Reno, I hope I pronounced that right. Um, he's a doctor as well with a PhD uh, from Harvard University. Currently, he's a researcher at the French Institute for Sustainable Development with a particular interest in global health and planetary health. Um, he's a vet veterinary doctor by training who, so, who specializes in public health through um, the multidisciplinary background, which is a master in um, at the Ecole, Doctorale de, Ecole des Attitudes de Santé Publique. He also did a PhD in, in disease ecolo ecology at Montpellier University and, had, um, and did a postdoctoral fellowship in global health and social medicine from Harvard Medical School. Um, currently, he's based in Madagascar, working with Astrid Pasteur, and uh, his research focuses on the impact of, on the impact that interactions between ecological and socioeconomic factors have on the health of populations in developing countries, and in order to find sustainable and, uh, and sustainable and targeted solutions. Uh, thank you and. Um, I look forward to great deliberations from our speakers. Uh, Dr. Renzo, you can start um, the presentation. Great. Can you hear me and can you see my slides now? Yes, I can. Excellent, excellent. Bonjour, magandang araw from the Philippines. Good morning uh, in France. Um, thank you for having me in this uh, inaugural uh, webinar of Planet France. I am very glad to hear that uh, uh, in, in your part of the world, you're building your community uh, for planetary health, for its advancement. And I was asked to share 
uh, or to talk about uh, planetary health, give a brief introduction, um, and in the poster, as you can see, debunk myths and misconceptions. So it sounds a bit mysterious. Uh, but what I'm going to do is basically to introduce the main concepts, the main themes of this new, uh, you know, concept or framework of planetary health. And in the process, maybe we are, we'll be able to touch on this, you know, misunderstandings or misconceptions. And maybe later during the Q&A, you can even ask for uh, further clarification. So um, again, I'm Renzo Guinto from PH Lab, which stands for Planetary Health, but also the Philippines, which is uh, the country where I'm from. So let me go to the... So I'm sure everyone is asking, is the COVID-19 pandemic related to planetary health? And of course, you know, you, sh you would have anticipated already the answer, you know, the quick answer is yes. And in, the, in this whole webinar, we will be touching on some, you know, different aspects of the COVID-19 uh, epidemic and how it intersects with uh, planetary health. But we know that um, in this era of planetary health, we're facing climate change, we are uh, confronted with many different forms of environmental changes. Um, infectious diseases will definitely be affected uh, and even transformed uh, by, what's, what, by, the, by the things that we are seeing. Um, and that is why uh, an integrated approach, an integrated view, um, looking at infectious diseases, not just at the micro, but in the environment in, in which they operate, the societies where they thrive, uh, the natural ecosystems where they come from, it's important to look at all these aspects and planetary health is offering us that opportunity to come up with an integrated approach. You should be familiar uh, already as planetary health enthusiasts with this seminal document, the 2015 report of the Rockefeller Foundation and the Lancet, which basically introduced the term planetary health. Uh, it's, it says here, it's time for a new discipline. And what really is planetary health? Let's go back to the basics. According to the 2015 report, it refers to the health of human civilization and the state of the natural systems on which it depends. As you can already see, you know, and, and the way I, I simplify it is, it's the health of people and planet uh, combined. Um, and in some ways, it's a reaction to the older field of public health. I suspect many of us here are coming from that uh, disciplinary background. But as we know, public health is about the health of people, period. And oftentimes, if not most of the time, we have improved human health over the past century at the expense of the environment or without taking into account the ecological impact of our actions. In 2019, the Planetary Health Alliance, which is headquartered in Harvard University, uh, in a way redefined or clarified what planetary health is. As you can see in the earlier definition, it's more of a concept, but this time it explicitly called it or described it as an international and interdisciplinary field focused on characterizing and addressing the human health impacts of global environmental change. What are these global environmental changes that uh, planetary health is interested in? So in this slide, which you can see from uh, that reference, these are the different layers or levels of these uh, what you call anthropogenic changes that are shaping human health in the 21st century. Anthropogenic means human uh, induced. Uh, so these human induced perturbations in 
the ecosystems, whether it's pollution, biodiversity loss, land use changes, as you can see in that, uh, you know, uh, star, uh, all these changes, all these ecological drivers are ultimately affecting health in many different ways, as you can see on your right side, the whole gamut of health outcomes that are influenced by uh, these ecological uh, drivers. I'll not go into detail, uh, but this is a very good framework or diagram to, uh, to base if you are asking what are planetary health problems. Um, and as you can see, this uh, diagram already uh, enumerates many of them. Some people are, uh, and, and, or a lot of people are actually asking, uh, is planetary health a new field, a new discipline, as was earlier mentioned, uh, or is it what they call old wine in a new bottle? Uh, some say, is it a new policy framework, a new way of framing the policy issues that we are confronting? Uh, in this day and age, in this epoch of the Anthropocene. That's another term that is so uh, important in the planetary health framework. Anthropocene is the epoch that is proposed, the geological time uh, epoch that is proposed, uh, highlighting the influence of humanity in shaping the course of, of, of history, of, of the planet's history. Uh, is it a new scientific paradigm? Is it a new communication strategy? Is it a moral imperative? These are some of the questions or, or you know, the, the ideas that have emerged uh, in this new community of planetary health. Um, it's up to us or it's up to you to, to, choose, to pick and choose which one suits you uh, the best. Uh, for me, the way I see it is, um, it is an integrated view. It is a, a fresh look at all these issues that we're seeing. Uh, and what's important fundamentally is that we are looking at the health of people and the health of the planet uh, together, uh, which again is in contrast to how we look at health, human health in particular, uh, in the previous century. In this diagram, I try to simplify how uh, planetary health uh, as a field, as a discipline has emerged. And you will see two streams, one on the left, which is uh, the stream of, of public health, of, of human medicine. And on the other hand, uh, this, this stream uh, it originates from environmental health. Uh, and what I'm seeing is that there seems to be a, a convergence that is happening between the two streams. Uh, before, on the left, we talk about tropical medicine, which is the, about the health of colonizers in, in colonies, which eventually became public health, and then international health, which basically is the health of our former colonies from the perspective of uh, old uh, empires. And then it became global health, which is somehow the era where we're in now, talking about uh, the transnational nature of health issues, that diseases do not anymore uh, respect uh, national boundaries and therefore global responses are needed. On your right hand, you will see the origins from environmental health. And environmental health, I would say, is a, a good enough start because it looks at health and the environment uh, together. But what happened to environmental health is over time, it has become reductionist, linear thinking, downstream focus, trying to find the specific toxin or chemical that leads to a specific symptom, let's say particulate matter and how it's linked to asthma or uh, lead, how it's linked to autism. So, you know, it has become quite a reductionist, uh, you know, linking A to B as opposed to looking at entire environments, which is now being offered by uh, planetary health. One Health is a reaction from veterinary medicine, and I'm sure Andres can elaborate on that as a, a veterinarian himself. Uh, eco Health is coming from the field of ecology. Geo Health, you can uh, guess that it's from uh, the geological sciences. 
So now we're seeing that these two streams are coming together to form this again, new paradigm, new discipline called planetary health. This is a more complicated way of illustrating the, the previous slide, this is from Howie Frumpkin. But as you can see, basically, again, multiple disciplines uh, are converging to become what we now call planetary health. So, you know, maybe some of you uh, belong to any of these categories, some of these fields may be resonant, may be resonating with you. Uh, but planetary health is an opportunity for all of us to come together and address the issues that we share and the, the causes that we together uh, believe in. This is another simplified way of looking at planetary health. It's basically the entire sphere that brings all of this together. Public health, the health of humans, animal health, of course, health of animals bring them together, it's one health focusing on the zoonosis and the shared uh, health issue or the health issues shared by humans and animals alike. And then eco-health is looking at ecosystems and how they lead to uh, certain health outcomes. And then now we're looking at planetary health, which somehow looks at the, the interface between ecological and social systems, or you know, SES. Some of you from the ecological science may be familiar with the term. Uh, the report um, uh, in 2015 also highlighted uh, three challenges that many of the planetary health problems uh, do share. And again, maybe this is another way of, of looking at planetary health Problem. Some of you may be asking, what is a planetary health problem? And maybe this is one way to, to address the question. Planetary health problems are characterized by these three challenges. One is conceptual and empathy failures. They also call it imagination challenges. It, these are, you know, a lot of the planetary health problems are just so difficult uh, to imagine um, how an occurrence in the stratosphere is linked to certain health outcomes uh, you know, uh, tens of thousands of miles uh, below, uh, or, you know, the GDP, for example, as a metric of, of success of societies, uh, is it uh, a representation of how limited human imagination is, and certain, as a result, we're not able to capture a lot of the intangibles of, of society, or uh, such as, you know, natural capital. Why is it not uh, included in the valuation of, of progress? So that is the first challenge. The second one is knowledge failures, which they also call research and information challenges. Um, planetary health is encouraging us to really think creatively, imaginatively, out of the box in terms of how we do research systems thinking, complexity theory, so on and so forth. And finally, implementation failures, or what they also call governance challenges, the configuration of our governments, the design of our economies, they're just not compatible anymore with the magnitude, urgency, and scale of the planetary health problems that we encounter. And as you can see now with COVID-19, uh, there are questions about uh, the mismatch between our economy, how we operate, the, the, for, the formulation, the, the, the governance arrangements that we have in terms of, a, and, and the way we are addressing or responding to the crisis. Um, you know, to illustrate further the importance of multidisciplinarity and the, the complexity of planetary health problems, uh, this is Anthony McMichael, who is a climate and health pioneer. Um, he actually did not, uh, was not here anymore uh, when planetary health as a term was, was proposed. Um, but we, we always regard to him as a pioneer. And what did he say? The health sector, which I believe many of us here in this webinar are representing, must lift its gaze to bigger ecological horizons. This will require a radical extension of the public health agenda new forms of professional training, environmental health, a preparedness to base policy advice upon predictions and best guesses, and an ability to collaborate with unfamiliar disciplines like climatology 
or ecology, which is very, very unusual for health people to be working with these other uh, disciplines. Okay. Another framework that is so important in the field of planetary health is planetary boundaries. These are nine boundaries that uh, cannot be violated uh, if we are to ensure the survivability of the planet or the, to make sure that it's conducive for human survival. And as you can see, there are already two uh, boundaries that have already been breached according to the Stockholm Resilience Center biosphere integrity, we've seen the fastest rate of extinction of creatures great and small in the past century, and biogeochemical flows of nitrogen and phosphorus because of our addiction to artificial fertilizers um, in order to uh, fuel our food system. So as you can see, even the food system, which is important and vital for health and survival, has destroyed one of the planetary boundaries, rendering the planet less conducive for long, longer term human survival. And then uh, Kate Raworth, who is an economist from Oxford, uh, just came, also came up with this uh, uh, proposal of a donut economy, which builds on the planetary boundaries framework that I all, uh, also showed, uh, already showed to you a while ago. But this time, adding the social foundation, which is the inner circle of the donut. And what she is saying is that we should create regenerative and distributive economies that are in that inner circle of, uh, that are just within the donut, that safe and just space for humanity. I'll not go into detail, but, it, but I invite you to read this book, Donut Economy, Economics, which I think should be required reading for every planetary health advocate and student. Okay. And this is the transition that we need to have if we want a, 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 an enhanced and improved planetary health. This shift from um, this limitless growth model to the donut economy, which respects planetary boundaries, but at the same time meets basic human needs in an equitable manner. So I'm going towards the end of this segment of my presentation, which is the intro to planetary health. And as you can see, we are a growing community. Um, this is a picture from the inaugural conference of the Planetary Health Alliance in 2017. The fourth conference will be next year, 2020, 2021 uh, in Brazil. And I hope that, uh, uh, you know, of course our prayer is COVID ends before that happens so that we can all meet face to face. Um, but as you can see, we have a new journal. We have different university starting centers of planetary health. And so this is really an exciting time and an invitation for all of us to get involved. And I'm really glad that Planet France is building that community in France and in Europe, and now having a very international audience through this webinar. And so if we are going to build this community, we need to make sure education of future professionals, not just health professionals, but every professional involved or interested in improving planet, uh, planetary health uh, should have abide by these principles. Uh, and I'm not going to detail, but I invite you to look at this uh, um, uh, publication that was actually developed through uh, a massive consultation what should be the principles of planetary health education? And so you can see some of the key words there, urgency, governance, equity, system sticking, etc. And of course, apart from education, we need to think about who is the planetary health practitioner? What does planetary health practice look like? And so it's, it's also important to look at you know, the do part. And, you know, I came up with the seven eyes. We need to think about how to institutionalize planetary health in our governance systems, how to integrate multiple agendas, which is what planetary health is all about. How can we generate the money for investing in planetary health? How do we manage planetary health information? Because we are going to bring together climate information, water information, health information, what is the role of innovation in entrepreneurship? 
in advancing planetary health? How do we implement planetary health projects? And most importantly, how do we spread planetary health inspiration through effective communication? And then finally, just a quick reminder that while planetary health sounds new and innovative, it is important to give credit to whom it's due. Planetary health, the links between human health and the planet's health are not uh, an original idea uh, of, of our generation. If you look back to history, indigenous populations have already uh, espouse this idea that, that humans and the planet are interlinked. According to Chief Seattle, the earth does not belong to man. Man belongs to earth. Man did not weave the web of life. He is merely a strand in it. Whatever he does to, web, to the web, he does to himself. So that is my quick introduction about planetary health. And um, I don't know how we are going, uh, Pearl, uh, and Feline, how are we going to proceed to the next uh, segment? Yes, um, you can proceed um, so right away if you okay. prefer. Yes. Right, and I'm I'm being mindful of the time because I, uh, we need to hear from Andres as well. Uh, I'll just gonna give you a sneak preview of what are the problems or challenges in uh, uh, in planetary health in my part of the world, which is Southeast Asia. I was asked to to, you know, to focus on developing countries, low and middle income countries. I decided I took the liberty to focus in my region, which is actually a combination of developed and developing countries. And I think in this day, in this day and age that developing developed dichotomy need to be questioned. Um, I remember there was an environment, Filipino environmentalist who suggested that we should start categorizing countries into high consuming and low consuming countries. So, you know, maybe have ideas on how we can classify countries in a planetary health manner uh, beyond what uh, we, we've been taught uh, by economists, uh, for instance, in the past. So this is my part of the world, that's the Philippines, group of 7,000 plus islands. Um, and this part of the world is where basically uh, COVID-19 started in, in China. And Southeast Asia has already been described early, earlier as a microcosm of global health. As I said to you a while ago, rich countries, poor countries, you can find them in this region. But also uh, the, the, a diversity of healthcare systems, diversity of political arrangements, a diversity of disease burdens as well, we can be found in this region. And going back to COVID-19, what are the, some of these challenges? Uh, the human-animal interface is becoming uh, much, and, uh, much, uh, more, uh, much and much tighter uh, as people continue to, you know, uh, interact with wildlife, uh, you know, still a very meat-eating uh, culture, uh, but also rapid urbanization, which where you can see cities already expanding and encroaching uh, into uh, you know forest lands and and, and other uh, types of ecosystems, um, and that is why this region is 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 a hotspot for uh, emerging uh, novel infectious diseases, and that is why it's important that the uh, uh, sea surveillance is is heightened in this region. Uh, you know, a, a, a secure Southeast Asia leads to a secure world, uh, I, I, I strongly believe. But what are the other uh, planetary health problems that are present in the region? Uh, you know, the, this region is home to some of the world's biggest mega city, cities. And, and these cities um, are, are emitting a lot of, of air pollutants. Uh, as you can see, the, some of the most polluted cities in the world are in this region. Uh, interestingly, air pollution has gone down as a result of the lockdowns due to COVID-19. Uh, and it's a question, how can we maintain this level of air quality in a post-COVID world? Climate change is definitely a major issue in this region. These are some headlines from the region when it comes to our vulnerability, but also our level of preparedness uh, and resilience. And in this map, you can see that the region is highly vulnerable to uh, climate change. The Philippines 
is the most vulnerable. As you can see, it's red in this map. And there are recent studies that have shown that the levels of sea level rise uh, in the major cities of Asia have actually been underestimated. Um, Bangkok, for instance, in Thailand will be totally inundated in the next 50 years. And um, my doctoral thesis is about uh, climate change and, and health in the Fil in Philippine coastal municipalities. And here you will see some of the health problems, both the current and known, as well as the anticipated uh, that will happen or that, or that are already happening in, in Philippine uh, communities uh, as a result of climate change. And, you know, I can share with Pearl uh, my uh, short films uh, because, you know, when I was doing my thesis, I realized that, you know, the 200 page document will only be read by three people uh, at, le at the least. And so I turned them into films, which uh, uh, you can view and, and share uh, to your uh, different audiences. So the Philippines is number two in the climate risk index, as already uh, insinuated earlier. And, you know, hurricanes, which is the way you call typhoons in, in the, the Americas, for example, they're already as big as the country itself. Um, larger, uh, bigger in magnitude and, and severity and, and frequency. And what happens when these climate-related extreme weather events do occur, your uh, life-supporting systems, food, water, livelihood, education, even healthcare systems are disrupted, if not destroyed. And indeed, these calamities are the worst disaster to hit PH. And PH stands for the Philippines. But as I've already mentioned to you, PH stands also for planetary health and the people's health. And so this is my last slide. What are the underlying issues and dilemmas faced in the region and by many developing uh, regions of the world? Um, and it's important to look at the root causes, the causes of the causes, because uh, earlier I've shown to you the symptoms, air pollution, climate change, um, what else, uh, deforestation, urbanization, but these are the underlying issues. These countries, like the Philippines, are facing this dilemma between the aspiration for more economic growth, which many of the countries in the, in, in the North, in the West, high-income countries are, are modeling to us uh, versus the need, the urgent need for environmental protection. The second one is that these areas, well, the world empire is a place of not just persistent, but even growing inequality. And we know that the poor, the vulnerable, the, uh, or the poor and the marginalized indigenous populations, they are the more vulnerable sectors or segments of our society when it comes to environmental challenges. These countries are also facing resource constraints and they are home to some of the weak, uh, 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 relatively weaker health systems. And COVID-19 is even adding additional stress to these already weak health systems. A combination of Western lifestyle that is introduced to these societies, but also there are some cultural, you know, habits in the region, in these societies that are impeding us from pursuing environmental protection. For example, uh, slash and burn our agriculture, uh, which leads to for, uh, forest degradation. And then finally, addressing planetary health requires strong political will and strong democracies which are lacking in some of these places as well. And so these are some of the main challenges. And I hope that uh, in the way we address planetary health, we just, we just don't look at the symptoms. We also look at these causes of the causes. So I'll stop there and I look forward to uh, an exciting conversation later. Thanks. All right, so this is Andres. Should I just go on? Yes, um, so sure. thank you, Renzo. And um, here is um, Dr. Garci Torena to talk about um, in the, uh, about the challenges in developed countries. Thank you. Thanks, Beryl. 
Um, so yeah, this is Andres. Uh, I'm currently based in Madagascar. And even though my focus is mostly on developing countries, uh, I was asked to speak about developed countries and I come from a developed country. So I think I have <laughs> a kind of a good idea uh, of what some of those challenges are. So, uh, and actually many of you probably know most of the issues or many of the issues. So instead of uh, spending my talk enumerating them all, I'm just going to concentrate on a, on a couple of major issues. So this will be emerging infectious diseases and natural disasters. And uh, I'll move on from that. And then I'll focus on a challenge that I think is less well known, but is as important, which is the issue of equity and consumption in a world with limited resources. Um, so as it was uh, explained in a different way by Renzu, uh, you know, as humans, we basically depend and rely on ecosystem services stable climate, clean water, clean air, protection from floods, from landslides. And so whenever those ecosystems are damaged, then those services are impaired and we suffer the health and economic consequences. Um, so, you know, the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment uh, classify them in three different categories. So this can be, for example, direct health effects. So whenever there's a flood or a heat wave, there's increased mortality directly related to those events. Uh, this can be also ecosystem mediated health effects. So for example, when there's an increase in global temperature, then that can change the risk of infectious diseases because it, it impacts to the range, uh, the climate range of vectors and pathogens. And it, it, you can also have deferred or displaced health effects. So for example, as we consume uh, a lot of the planet's resources, eventually there'll be a moment where those resources will be very scarce and there will be potentially violent conflict. And so that is an effect that is sort of like deferred or displaced over time. Uh, and of course, developed nations are better protected from these issues, but these issues are global. And so they will affect us all in one way, one way or another. So let's start with the most obvious one right now, which is the emergence of infectious diseases. So as the graph on the left shows, uh, there's been an increase, a very steady increase in the new emerging infectious diseases that have been appearing over the last few decades. And this is true even after correcting for reporting bias. Um, most, the majority of these diseases are zoonotic. The, they originate in wildlife. And so even though, as you can see in the right map, uh, in those areas in yellow, they, those events mostly originate and will probably continue to originate in developing countries, uh, mostly from Southeast Asia, they, we understand now better than ever that those, these issues are global. So just one spillover event like COVID, uh, SARS-CoV-2, it's become in less than three months a global pandemic it has put a third of the global population under lockdown. It's forced G20 economies to mobilize about $5 trillion, which is the, higher, the highest amount of money that's ever been mobilized in history, way more than in any world war, in any economic crisis. And of course, it could end up killing dozens of uh, millions of people. And so these events are facilitated by you know, increase connectivity, increase uh, population density because of urbanization. And these are going, probably going to continue to increase. And not only that, but also because uh, climate change is expecting to increase global temperatures, then we will have, uh, and you know, diseases that are endemic currently in tropical and subtropical regions, they will potentially expand to more temperate areas like uh, developing, developed countries are in. A second obvious, I don't know how those <laughs> circles are being done. Uh, I'm not an expert on Zoom, sorry about that. Um, so a second obvious threat to developed nations are natural disasters, uh, mostly due to climate change and exacerbated by depletion of ecosystem services, 
reefs that offer protection against tsunamis or wetlands that offer protection against flooding. So as you can see in the figure on the left, the number of extreme weather events has been increasing over the last few decades. And so, you know, in about 40 years, it has nearly tripled from about 250 to around over 700. And these are mostly due to hydrological and meteorological events. And just to give you a sense of what the impacts of those are, so just if you just take into account uh, events in 10 years, so from 2005 to 2014, the total damage expected, it's about one and a half trillion dollars. Uh, and it has affected nearly a third of the population, so two billion, two billion people. And it has killed around a million people. It's what's estimated. So these events uh, under a scenario of climate change will obviously continue to increase and we will all suffer from them, whether developing or developed countries. We have seen heat waves in Europe, we have seen hurricanes happening with increased frequency and increased severity in the US. Um, and so I won't go into much detail around this figure, but what I wanted to put forward in, ter in terms of a lens from a developed country is this realization that resources are limited and we are reaching those limits really fast and in a very unequitable way. So if we want to ensure that everybody has basic access to energy, food and water, uh, we're going to have to rethink the way uh, economies are done, uh, consumption is done, etc. And so, uh, Renzo already mentioned that a, a couple of uh, planet boundaries are already surpassed. I would say that those are with high uncertainty, with, with sorry, beyond high uncertainty, but we have some others that with less certainty we think we have already surpassed and many others what, that we're basically reaching. And so I wanted to just concentrate on a couple of those uh, to give you an idea. So the first one is water. So over the last 100 years, we have used an exponentially increasing amount of water uh, to the limit where right now we are basically appropriating around half of all accessible water and most of this is for agriculture for production food to feed us and so if you look at the map on the right we can see so in in blue you can see areas of water scarcity and so you will see that developing countries mostly in africa some in in southeast asia they are already suffering from water scarcity and so developed countries through their consumption patterns, through the importation of food, importation of raw materials, of biofuels, were effectively extracting water resources from these economies and were contributing to water insecurities in, in these areas. Uh, and so for instance, it is estimated that one kilogram of chocolate requires over 17,000 liters of water to produce. And most of this water happen you know most of this water extraction happens at the source in order to obtain the cocoa and sugar um, if we focus on land so in the last 200 years we have converted around 40 percent of the earth's land surface uh, whether it's cropland or pasture and so at the same time we've basically lost around a third of all tropical forests in the world and if you look to the graph on the right, you can see an analysis of about the last 50 years, uh, projections for the next 50, and you will see that that's even going to get worse because most of the land that is going to be, to keep being converted, is going to be in tropical and subtropical forests, which are essentially the greatest carbon sinks uh, to fight against climate change, and also some of the greatest hubs of biodiversity. Um, and while we're doing all of this in order to produce food, we have to be aware that two thirds of all of that agricultural land, we're using it to grow uh, meat, sorry, <laughs> to grow meat, to, you know, to enable animals to eat so that we can eat meat. And so consumption patterns in terms of meat consumption in developed countries 
and also in emerging economies uh, are basically absolutely unsustainable. Which essentially brings us to the concept that I want to put forward, which is the equity in consumption of waste. Right? So all of these limits that we are seeing, that we are either reaching or surpassing, they're essentially, at the moment, you know, the result of the consumption by the richest 20% of the population. This is crazy, right? Uh, so the richest 20% in 2005 consume about three quarters of all private consumption. And this has increased uh, since the financial crisis because we live in a world that is more inequitable now than it was a few years ago. And so if we want to achieve equitable access, we're gonna have to radically change those uh, consumption patterns. Um, at the same time, if you look at the graph on the right, you, you will realize that we are incredibly wasteful as a global economy. So if we take into account the 100 billion tons of stuff that entered the global economy in 2015, you realize that around two thirds of all of that was dispersed into the environment as unrecoverable waste, right? So this includes, for example, the fact that half of all food ends up waste uh, in the trash, that around one third of energy that we produce ends up being dissipated in the form of heat. And so in the end, the less than 10% of everything that we produce ends up being recycled and reduced. So we will need to work towards much more efficient systems. Uh, and so given all of that we have seen so far and with a world population that will increase by about 50% in the, in the next 30 years to reach around 10 billion people, if we, if we also take into account the fact that climate change is going to have disproportionate effects on the most vulnerable people, so developing countries essentially, um, we can really see that one of the greatest challenges in the near future is going to be violent conflict over really scarce resources and potentially mass migration to those places that are better off, right? And so as a developed country or developed countries in general, we have a huge responsibility and even a selfish interest to improve these patterns of consumption of waste in order to make them more equitable and more accessible to everyone. And so finally, let's just not start uh, even, you know, let's not finish even more the press that we were already before beginning this seminar. So I want to speak about uh, some ongoing and potential solutions and like with every problem that is complex, there will not be silver bullets or a single solution that will fix everything. So we will need a combination of technological innovation in order to make uh, food production and energy production more efficient, but we will also need radical changes in policies, in economic systems, and also in individual behaviors. Right, so some of these initiatives are already underway, of course. Uh, so for example, the Paris Agreement that I hope everybody has heard of uh, established already mechanisms and commitments for the decarbonization of economies. And these included technology transfers and compensation mechanisms for developing countries to hopefully limit global temperatures to a rise of up to two degrees. Another big initiative right now is the European Green Deal. So this is one of the cornerstones of the neck of this European Commission's term and is the farthest reaching environmental policy that's ever been undertaken by the EU, which integrates uh, sustainability in every pillar of the EU's activities. And so among others, what it includes is uh, a promotion of what is called the circular economy. Uh, which is meant to reduce waste at every step of the production and consumption product, uh, process. Uh, another thing that uh, it promotes is, for example, the you know, healthy and environmentally friendly food systems because of all of the issues that we have seen and, and so on. But of course, the success and speed of progress that these initiatives and many others will have will depend absolutely on the ambition and also on the investments that are mobilized 
in taking into account that we are societies that are typically short-term and reactive more than proactive. Uh, so just to give you an example, the amount that the European Central Bank has mobilized in less than a month for the COVID-19 response uh, is roughly equivalent uh, to what the whole EU was hoping to mobilize in 10 years, both from private and public investments. And so in the end, it's going to be pretty much up to us and our willingness to take on these challenges ahead of time. Thank you. Let me just... Uh, all right. so, uh, thank you, Renzo and Andres, for the very informative presentations. And now we're going to move over to the Q&A session. Under the participants section, there is a raise hand button. If you want, if you have a question to ask, please press the button and, and we will <laughs> let you um, ask your questions. We have a very shy audience, it seems. You can also type your questions if you're too shy to, to ask them. Or else we will be the ones to ask you a question or two. <laughs> <laughs> no, we don't want that. <laughs> we'll come up with a quiz. Well, one comment here, I'd be very interested if the speakers could share the references they use. Sure. Um. Um, do you mind if I ask something? Hi, Renzo, by the way. Hi, this is Deo, right? <laughs> Hi, Renzo. Hi, Dr. Gagatorena. Yeah, I just wanted to ask one question first. Uh, so as, as I understand it, the success or influence of a perspective, including planetary health, depends a lot also on the clout and influence that the actors that champion that particular perspective. So um, from your experience, who or what institutions would you say are the major backers of this perspective? Um, it could be global level or it could be local level if you prefer. Thanks, Deo, for that question. And you're actually raising an important point about the, the politics of knowledge and, and uh, you know, how, uh, you know, different disciplines uh, emerge. And unfortunately, um, you know, scientific disciplines, you know, new communities, um, they, they succeed, uh, not, unfortunately, not just because of the unique contribution that they make, but also, as you've already implied, uh, the influence uh, of, of the actors, you know, behind, uh, behind a, a, cert, a new idea, for example. Um, for Planetary Health, uh, as I've mentioned already a while ago, the Planetary Health Alliance is based uh, at Harvard University. Um, it, 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 it was uh, built with the support of the Rockefeller Foundation. Um, and there are other universities across the world, the London School of Hygiene, um, uh, et cetera, et cetera, that, that have already created, you know, programs or centers of planetary health. Uh, but the challenge now is, you know, we've, we've, we've passed through the birthing pains of a field, and then now we need to ensure its sustainability, that's one, and we need to even scale it up further to make sure that, you know, universities, for example, in in Asian countries or in Africa are also being uh, reached by, you know, what I always describe as a, as a positive virus of planetary health. So, that, so that's uh, the next challenge. Um, and, and unfortunately, the, the Rockefeller Foundation is not anymore uh, putting a lot of investment in, in planetary health. We're hoping that other philanthropic uh, organizations will step up. And fundamentally, we want uh, policy-oriented or, uh, organizations such as the World Health Organization, uh, the UN, and national governments to also uh, embrace planetary health as a new field and as a new paradigm. And so this is a challenge, and I think uh, the young people 
in this webinar, around 70 of us, will play a critical role in making sure that planetary health continues and also uh, advances um, in the years and decades to come. Thank you, Renzo. I think there's a raised hand from Marina, and we also have uh, one, two, three questions in the chat. Uh, so maybe you have Marina first. Yes, hello. C can you hear me? Yes. Ah, thank you very much for your presentation. It was very, very interesting. Um, I am an, an, an um, EHSP student in um, the Master of Public Health. I have a question. Um, would you have any recommendations in how to um, how to find solutions for the government, uh, the governance challenges in finding solutions and policies for um, climate change? Um, Renzo, do you want to take this one? Uh, you start first because you, uh, you you talk about COP uh, twenty one. Is that? Sure, you can go ahead. Oh, okay. Well. You know, I, I have probably uh, way less experience in, in how governance works, but, um, but you know, like what is needed is uh, partly what Renzo was saying, right? Is some of the problem is our imagination challenges, right? Like it, un, unless we move away from the, this concept that we should all only focus on how many decimal points of GDP have we grown, then it'll be really hard because they, there'll be little incentive for uh, people in government positions in order to improve on these challenges, right? Because we will see progressively that probably GDP and environmental sustainability in a way will, will be sort of counterintuitive. And so, so yeah, I, I don't necessarily have a solution, but of course, any uh, big impact solutions that will have to be envisioned will necessarily have to be sort of not only multidisciplinary, but m sort of multilateral. Uh, as we have seen, for example, with the Sustainable Development Goals, the Paris Agreement, etc. So I'll add to what Andres uh, has, has mentioned. Uh, interestingly, uh, just today or last night, uh, COP26, which is supposed to happen in December or November in Scotland, has already been postponed to 2021. And I just tweeted this morning that this gives us ample time to come up to develop a, you know, an ambitious strategy for planetary health protection. You know, postponement doesn't mean we need to, to wait until 2021 to come up with something. The behind the scenes work will need to continue if not intensify. There is a need for stronger health sector leadership um, now more than ever in the climate discourse. I hope we will also use the lessons from COVID to you know, uh, intensify and to, to, to fuel further uh, climate action, which will benefit human health, but will also be uh, beneficial to our economies in our societies. In fact, if you notice, um, the, co the experience that we're having with COVID-19 is somehow showing to us how the initial phase of decarbonization may happen. You know, air pollution has gone down, uh, coal plants in China have been shut down. But of course, it also tells us that rapid and uncareful uh, you know, change or transformation that is so drastic, it happens overnight without taking into account the effect or the consequences on the vulnerable can be very harmful. And so there's so many lessons that we can glean from uh, the COVID experience. So if we are going to do this again, not the epidemic, but the transition towards, you know, healthier and more sustainable economies, um, then, you know, we, we hopefully will be able to reach the, the climate targets uh, embedded in the Paris Agreement. I, I totally agree. Thank you very much.
So there were two questions here from Sophie and Sin, uh, Sinid, sorry, uh, Sinid, Sinia Troy. I think they were both on the climate change also. So I think they were they were partly addressed in the previous question, but do just mention in the chat if you think there was a particular new ones that you, you think uh, still needs to be asked. Uh, if you don't mind, I'll go to uh, uh, Michael Prometelia's question. Um, he was asking about the level of planetary health in education, particularly in the concept of the Philippines. And he was wanted to ask if how this kind of concept can be mainstreamed. Right. And, and I answered him directly there in the chat box that uh, we're starting a sim, you know, a similar community, a community similar to Planet, Planet Health France uh, here in the Philippines. So the more the merrier. Uh, but I guess because of our international audience, I'll try to be a bit broader and how we can bring planetary health to our respective communities. It's so important that we localize or to put in or contextualize, put into context, you know, universal planetary health messages into, and turn them into something that resonates with our people, with our communities. And so um, that is so important. Uh, and that is why, uh, you know, working with frontline communities, we've been hearing a lot about frontliners uh, these days, and, and planetary health will require working with communities on the ground, as opposed to the old model where academics stay in the ivory tower, observing phenomena uh, from, uh, from outside. That is not the way to do planetary health if we want it to, to succeed and to be embraced by all. Um, and I think linking to the earlier question, you know, the, 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 it, it's important that there, you know, the, 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 the science to policy link is also very crucial. Uh, again, we're not doing science for science sake in the era of planetary health. We want our science to be useful and to be used immediately by policymakers and communities. And so in our, you know, exercise, um, in, plan, uh, in planetary health, there should be a very, um, you know, multi-sectoral uh, and multidisciplinary uh, approach, bringing together civil society, even the young people uh, and innovators and entrepreneurs. Uh, I think that's also another answer to the climate question. Uh, you know, COVID-19 is showing to us the uh, overflowing human creativity you know, from PPEs that are developed uh, home, you know, from, from home, uh, you know, to ventilators. Uh, and so it's just amazing how, you know, uh, this is mobilizing uh, human innovation. And I hope we can channel that to addressing planetary health problems. <clears throat> My question or <laughs> who's moderating? So Dio, do you wanna uh, propose more questions or how do you wanna do Sorry, it with I, the, the internet just kind of um, I've liked a bit. So there's another comment. There's actually quite a bit of comments and I heard from Pearl that if uh, people are okay, we can ask, since there seems to be quite a few questions, we can uh, extend by a few more minutes as needed. So there's another question here. Um, I think it ties rather closely with the earlier uh, question on the, the politics of knowledge. It mentions that uh, aren't all these disciplines a product of investment founded by foundations? For example, conservation medicine jump started with the VCAN Rasmussen Foundation, Eco Health with IDRC funding, One Health with Australian funding to one group, CIRO, and now Planetary Health with Rockefeller. So um, yeah, I think that seems to be more of a comment. I don't know if you have a, a little bit yeah. more insight to add. Right. And to, to add, you know, uh, the Rockefeller Foundation even claims that they invented the field of public health because of their earlier investments in schools of public health in the United States. So, uh, you know, for sure. And I, I'm pretty sure even outside of health, we will see parallel examples of how, you know, new disciplines, new... Um, areas of, of knowledge uh, have grown because of investments from a certain, you know, entity, usually a foundation. Uh, of course, with, with, with 
with self-interest. Um, and and um, I think the way to make sure that uh, uh, a field advances, but it but also becomes uh, shared by all, um, is to have more players um, into you know uh, entering the pool. Um, and that's why I've been always advocating that planetary health, for example, should not be stuck in places like Harvard or Oxford or the London School. We need to bring them to universities in Asia, Africa, and Latin America. And what we need to build in this day and age is not another professional society alone, but a movement. And when you say it's a movement, it needs people from outside academia, and that means from the field, world of practice, and I highlighted that in my slides, but also from civil society and communities that are in the front lines. Thank you, Renzo. I, I noticed one comment here that I think needs to be highlighted. This is from Maria. She thanks everyone for the discussion and she urges us to not forget the inclusion of the humanitarian sector, considering that the experience of current climate change and planetary health challenges are located in humanitarian hotspots. Right, and, and thanks Maria, who's our friend from Doctors Without Borders joining us. Um, uh, and MSF is already thinking a lot about how they can uh, reorient uh, MSF uh, to become more relevant in the planetary health era. Uh, humanitarian organizations are usually uh, 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 in, the, in the receiving end of all of these, you know, when there's a natural calamity happening or mass migration due to some drastic environmental phenom phenomenon, uh, they're the ones responding to their health needs. But I think um, you, the humanitarian sector will need to adopt a more preventive approach to make sure that those massive migrations and uh, the human cause of in, uh, environmental degradation and natural disasters uh, do not happen or at least minimized. And, and um, the likes of MSF will, will be, be, uh, will, will be uh, in, in, in a better place if they work with people who are um, concerned with protection and prevention uh, and making sure we build resilient societies uh, even before the, the shock uh, occurs. Yeah, maybe I'll add something to complement what Renz is saying. Like, uh, I, I mostly work with, uh, with NGOs, with humanitarian organizations, and it is a great space because uh, some of these organizations, of course, are in the areas of greatest needs and also it allows uh, for innovation in a way that governments generally cannot do. But of course, any sort of big impact uh, investments, any big impact change, it has to happen because of governments, because of, you know, multilateral agreements. And so while definitely the humanitarian sector is really relevant, but I think we, you know, we should be aware that we need to have people in those governments to be sort of aware and sensitive to these sort of uh, disciplines and these sort of insights. Thank you, Renzo and uh, Andres. Uh, we only have around one to two minutes left. If there are any more questions, uh, kindly type them up. Um, otherwise, we could, could have a quick summary to wrap up the, the rather fruitful discussion we have. All right, so yeah, thank you everyone for that very lively and insightful question and answer session. So to wrap things up, I would just like to say that this has been very insightful. And with what's happening today, planetary health has been more and more relevant to us with you know, our climate change pandemic going on, biodiversity loss and our governments. It's time for a new discipline, which is planetary health. And that takes into account the 
interconnectedness of different sectors at the international level, whether you are from a developing country or a developed country. So with that in mind, I would like to thank you for attending our you know, uh, webinar, our first ever webinar. For future events, I would like to invite you to like our social media accounts. So we are on Facebook named Planet France and we're also in LinkedIn named Planet France as well. All right, so may you have a wonderful evening and I wish everyone to stay safe and stay at home. Thank you, Renzo. Thank, thank you, thank you everyone. Uh, Dr. Guy Kitorena. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, thank thank you, you Renzo. Thank you, Andres, and everyone. Thank you for participating. Thank you. Have a good day.